guys, it's Monica, and today I'm gonna to be talking about how to write an effective discharge summary. So this is a skill that's super important for med students, interns, residents, whoever, because most people will have to write a discharge summary as long as they're taking care of a patient in the inpatient setting. And I wanted to let you guys know that I'm also on Instagram, so head on over there to see a whole different side of me. Now let's get started. So what we're gonna do in this video is first, I'm gonna talk about the main components of a discharge summary. Then I'm gonna really hone in on how to write a good hospital course, because that's obviously the hardest part of the discharge summary to write. And then I'm gonna walk through a good example of a discharge summary. So the order of the components might change depending on what template your institution uses, but I think the major components will probably be the same. So you wanna put your team information, so your information and who took care of the patient. Then you wanna put which consultants there were. And then really important is admission diagnoses and discharge diagnoses. So admission diagnoses are the reason why the patient was admitted. And this could be different from what ultimate diagnosis that the patient was discharged with. So for example, let's say the patient came in with acute hypoxic respiratory failure, but it wasn't clear in the beginning what the cause was. So the admission diagnosis would be acute hypoxic respiratory failure, and then the discharge diagnosis, so once the diagnosis was made, could be something like PCP pneumonia. And then you wanna put the patient's disposition. Where is the patient going? Is the patient going home? Is the patient going to an acute rehab unit? To a skilled nursing facility or home with home health. So there are various options. So you wanna specify where the patient went when they were discharged. And then you wanna mention the patient's discharge condition. So this could be stable or sick. I mean, hopefully they wouldn't still be sick when you're discharging them, but sometimes patients can leave against medical advice. And then I guess in that situation, you might use that. Then you wanna write a brief HPI. So not gonna lie, I am gonna be real with you guys. Most people will copy paste the HPI from the h &P, including me, and I don't think that's a huge deal. So if you need to save time, then I think by all means you can do that. And then there's the hospital course, which is definitely the hardest part to write. So I'm gonna go into detail on that in a little bit. And then you wanna put any important and key procedures, imaging, and labs that the patient got the patient's discharge physical exam, so what they look like when they were discharged, and then importantly, the outpatient provider to-do list, so what is there left to follow up on the outpatient side, and then finally, the medication list. So the outpatient provider list and the medication list are two really, really important sections of, of the discharge summary, so you really wanna pay attention and make sure that those are updated and accurate. All right, now let's go into the details on how to write a hospital course. So guys, when I was a medical student, the first discharge summary I wrote took me two hours, and I'm not even exaggerating. So hopefully you guys will know what to write based on this video, and it won't take you as long when you write your first discharge summary. So there are two ways to write a hospital course. One is just a brief paragraph of what happened during the hospitalization, and that's it or you can do a problem list. And when you do a problem list, you wanna put a brief summary at the top, then put the problem list under that. So the paragraph form, I really would only recommend using if the hospitalization was super short, like two or three days. Then it's like, what is the point of writing out this huge problem list? But any longer than that, it's really helpful to people reading your summary later if you actually organize it into a problem list. All right, so how do you know what to actually put in the hospital course? Number one, the acute conditions that were treated, and of course, any conditions that developed during the hospitalization. So what details do you wanna put about those acute conditions? So these include findings that led to the diagnosis or ruled out a diagnosis, key medications that were used to treat those most important conditions like antibiotics or diuretics, et cetera, and then procedures. So for example, if a patient had an intra-abdominal abscess and interventional radiology drained it. So obviously you wanna make sure that that big procedure was in your hospital course. And then imaging. So if a patient got five different chest x-rays during their admission, you do not need to put the results of all five of those chest x-rays. Only put findings that either led to a diagnosis or changed management or gave a sense of the severity of a condition and maybe that determined what you did next. Any major consults, so if you had a patient with severe COPD exacerbation, pulmonology was consulted. You wanna make sure you put that in the hospital course. And then the next thing is super important, plan after discharge. Now this is really key for any doctors who are taking care of your patient in the outpatient setting. They need to be able to see a good summary of what needs to be done after discharge. And you can put a brief 
summary of this in your hospital course. And then another thing you want to emphasize is any change in clinical status. And what I mean by that is if the patient got sick enough that he or she went to the ICU, that is super important information to put in. So we're gonna go over what is a pretty decent discharge summary. All right, so here we got the admission date and discharge dates, which I didn't mention before, but yes, they are at the top of the discharge summary. And then the team that took care of the patient, and then the admission diagnosis and discharge diagnosis. So notice here that the admission diagnosis and the discharge diagnosis are the same. So they're both acute decompensate heart failure. And that's probably because when the patient was first admitted, they had clearly had acute decompensate heart failure and there wasn't really a better diagnosis. So that is why they were admitted. So in this case, the admission diagnosis and discharge diagnosis can be the same. And notice that the list of discharge diagnoses is so much longer because yes, while the patient was hospitalized, they didn't just get treated for the acute syncomacy heart failure. They were found to have AFib with RBR, they got a TTE, and they found preserved ejection fraction, the patient had nocturnal hypoxia, and you took care of the patient's chronic medical conditions. So those count too. Anything you've treated the patient for during the hospitalization should go under discharge diagnoses. Then there is the brief HPI, and then the hospital course. So this is what I was talking about when I mentioned having a paragraph followed by a problem list. So in the paragraph, that is only a brief summary of just the key things that happened during the hospitalization. The key things that people need to know to just even have a sense of what went on during the hospitalization. So here we go. In this hospital course, it says that in the ED, the patient was found to be tachycardic to 120s, hypertensive to 165 or 100, blah, blah, blah. And her exam was notable for these things. And so there was a conclusion that the patient had acute to compensate heart failure, and it was thought to be secondary to poorly controlled hypertension because of her blood pressure. She underwent IV diuresis and then transitioned to oral Lasix, and then she was started on these new medications. And then of note, she had this other issue that developed during the hospitalization that raised concern for OSA. So here, again, just the findings that led to the major diagnosis any medication changes, and any new diagnosis that happened during the hospitalization. And then you move on to the problem list. So here is the first problem, the major reason the patient was hospitalized, which was the acute decompensate heart failure. And this POA, so this is like a billing thing that you don't need to worry about if you're a medical student or really if you're a resident, but if but the billing people, billing department needs to know if the condition was present on admission or not. So if it was present on admission, you put POA for present on admission. So you had the brief paragraph at the top. So now in the problem list, you can go into a little more detail about each problem. So for acute decompensate heart failure, we included the TTE findings, we included what risk factors the patient had, what specific dose of Lasix that she got while she was hospitalized. And then what's important is there's a plan. So the plan should be the discharge plan. What is the patient gonna have done about this problem once the patient's discharged? So the patient was, di was discharged with this dose of Lasix and was told to monitor the patient's daily weights and the patient should have follow-up with cardiology. So this isn't something I've mentioned yet, but follow-up appointments are super, super important. So make sure that there's a list of what follow-up appointments the patient needs so that nothing falls through the cracks. Next is new onset AFib with RVR. So this is the first time the patient had AFib. You're gonna talk about who was consulted, what medication the patient was transitioned to, whether or not the patient met criteria for anticoagulation, et cetera, et cetera. So here in the plan, we have the new medications with the doses, and then we have Xyopatch, which is workup that's gonna continue once the patient's discharged, and what follow-up the patient needs. One thing I wanna mention is that earlier I said that you should leave out doses. Sorry for the confusion, the doses you can leave out of like that really key summary, but when you're actually talking about the discharge medications and what dose the patient should be on when they leave, that is really important to include. So medication doses should be included in the discharge plan. And then moving on to the other section, this patient did not end up having any procedures, relevant imaging, really important patient came in with heart failure, got a TTE, so obviously that result should be in your note. 
any chest x-ray findings that supported this diagnosis of acute decompensating heart failure, that new EKG finding with AFib with RVR, and then relevant labs. So you just want to put the latest labs and also any key findings that were found during the hospitalization. So this patient had AFib with RVR, so part of the diagnostic workup for that is to check a TSH for hyper or hypothyroidism. So that was included in the labs in the discharge summary. And then this is the patient's physical exam on the day of discharge. And then here, really important, the outpatient provider to-do list. So here, even though you already mentioned it in the plan up above, you're nicely putting it all together into a list for the outpatient provider to quickly look at and know what to follow up on. So the provider needs to follow up an outpatient sleep study, the provider needs to adjust the Lasix dose if needed, and the provider needs to follow up on Xyopatch results. Pending labs, so this can be a separate section or it can be part of the outpatient provider to-do list, but in this case there wasn't anything pending when the patient was discharged. Discharge medications, so you need to separate out what's new and what has changed and what has not changed. So emphasize especially new medications and if a home medication dose was changed. These things are really the key parts of the discharge medication list. Condition at discharge, this patient was fair. Disposition, this patient went straight home. And then follow up. So sometimes we list out follow up appointments for the patient if they were luckily already scheduled during the hospitalization. So you would put those dates and times in the discharge summary as well. And that's it guys. If you learned something, give this video a like and subscribe for more content on how to succeed in medical school. All right, bye guys.